and I always think that uh, a vet has the hardest job because you go to the doctor and you can tell them what's wrong. However, you go to the vet with your horse and you say, I think this or that might be the issue. And then we add in games and complications of our athletes. So uh, we're very fortunate to have the Equestrian Australia Para Equestrian Team Vet here with us. She's been our FEI vet for the first show in a very busy schedule. Please make her welcome, Janine Dwyer. <laughs> So um, we're talking today about the transport of equine athletes and I think the overview of today's part about transport is to give, uh, there's, to be honest, there's not a lot of veterinary management in horse transport but I think owners or potential owners need to understand what goes on in the transport of horses overseas. It's a big gig for horses and people should understand what's involved and how things can be sometimes out of your control. And the people that, despite the people handling them being very good, that um, circumstances can still lead to the horses being unwell at the end of the trip. And so you should have an understanding of what goes on. And then we'll talk a bit about um, management of horses in hot and cold climates. So, the travel effects on horses, uh, the tr prolonged travel in particular may result in stress, fatigue and eventually illness. The more often the horse travels, the more adapted they become to this stress. But stress occurs when the horse is required to make abnormal or extreme adjustments in its behaviour or the internal management or physiology in order to cope with the adverse aspects of its environment and management. So as I said, there are risks associated with long haul travel and everyone associated with that animal needs to understand it. On the positive side, I think that this, like veterinary science, is an evolving thing. So 10, 20 years ago, um, they didn't have things like big sheds to load and unload the horses in. Now they have temperature control sheds in a lot of the airports. So, and in the next 10 and 20 years, these horses are worth a lot of money. And so uh, I think things will continue to evolve and improve and hopefully we'll have faster planes as well. So, so this transport-related stress can induce behavioural, physiological and pathological changes in the horse. So they can decrease their food intake while they're travelling, so their body mass. They can have behavioural changes, so they get very excited, some of them. They're under stress, it's all different. Or they can become, if they're a little bit unwell, they can become very lethargic and depressed. So there's a lot of energy expanded in the movement of horses during transport because you have acceleration, deceleration, oscillations of the air stable during the travel. And so they are standing the entire time. So it's much like being worked. There's a lot of energy expended. There's an elevation in the stress hormone cortisol. There are electrolyte changes in some of them, particularly if they're unwell, and biochemical changes, and th there is the possibility of illness during the trip. So, and this can include respiratory diseases, it can include laminitis, uh, all the normal sort of cuts and colics that you get with every horse, and uh, so they're, they're all possibilities. So what factors influence uh, this physiological stress or the possibility of the horse becoming ill? So there are environmental factors, there's um, the transport vehicle or the air stable design, there's management of the horses during the transport, and there are biological responses of the individual horse. So when we're talking about the environmental factors, we're talking about the ambient temperature. Um, so this can be hot or cold. Um, sometimes when you're, like, um, I'll talk about one instance, uh, if you've got to change planes or something, it can be very hot or very cold on the tarmac. And what you have to remember is that horses are cargo. It doesn't matter what we think of our horses, they're cargo to the airlines. So you have to wait until the other plane is ready or you have to just be where you're told 
and, uh, and it can be, the temperature variation can be very different. So in the sheds where they're unloading and loading the horses into the air stables, they often keep the temperature about 22 degrees Celsius. But on an international flight, the temperature is around 16 degrees Celsius. So a lot of these air stables have uh, at least two or three horses in them. And so it can get quite hot in the stables. So 16 degrees Celsius is enough to keep the horses reasonably comfortable. And it also doesn't burn up the fuel of the aircraft. So it doesn't cost as much for, to run it at that temperature. But then domestically, in, like when we went to the World Games in Kentucky, um, those domestic flights can be as low as five degrees. So they're very, very cold. Um, horses don't wear rugs in the plains uh, because of the... Um, and horses, as we'll talk about, they maintain their temperature very well. So they don't wear rugs. Um, but as far as the groom or the vet's concerned, you need to be prepared. So the humidity can be an issue. Um, as I said, uh, we are, it can be very, very hot and humid. So uh, we arrived with a horse in um, Singapore. There was a problem with the plane. We had to change planes. And so we sat on the tarmac. I was sitting in the air stable with two horses. Um, it, it would have been about 40 degrees Celsius and about 60 or 70 percent humidity and we had an insect net proof net over the top of the whole air stable because we weren't allowed to have it um, free to bugs getting into the air stable and the horse became one of the horses became very very distressed and panting but you just have to try and deal with those situations, try and keep it cool with the water you've got, try and help the animal. But you break quarantine if you open up the air stable or if you, you can't get the horse off, so you've got to suck it up. And people need to understand that the conditions are not always what we want for our horses, so we just have to manage them. Oh, sorry. So the season, it'll depend when your um, various countries you go to. Anchorage is a country that go to a lot. Um, and then the Asian countries can be very hot. So it can be different seasons. The day length, time of day, you might end up traveling all through periods of night time. So um, that all varies. And then the ambient air quality. So the dust, the pollen and the ammonia. So you can see this, um, this is an air stable here. You can see the plastic underneath the air stable that catches all the urine. There's nothing to um, wreck a plane more than horse urine spilling onto the aeroplane. So all that urine is caught underneath in the plastic. The manure piles up behind the horse because you can't access the horse. And so the ambient air quality um, becomes uh, a bit rough in very long haul trips. So this is Anchorage. Um, this is just a view out of a plane transporting horses to another cargo plane. So you have all different sorts of conditions that you might land in. So also influencing uh, transport stress is the type of air stable or the air stable design. So important is the ventilation, the windows, um, the air able to dissipate out of the air stable, um, so the dissipation of the interior gases and particles. It should be uh, fairly insulated against noise, high intensity sounds, because that's very stressful to the horses. Uh, it should be fairly well covered so that um, there are a few visual distractions to the horses. And then they should have good suspension because there's a lot of vibrations and oscillations and acceleration and deceleration. And a group of Japanese did a study and they found that heart rate is markedly increased with acceleration of a transport vehicle. So people should remember that when they stamp on the accelerator with their horse float or the horse truck, that um, it's, it's quite stressful for horses and they have to be able to balance in those. And there are good pilots that will be very considerate to a group of horses in their takeoffs and landings and try and be as smooth as possible. So at the end of the day, horses are cargo. So that's the horse stable up on the left there, next to the car and the other cargo. 
And actually, while I was researching this topic, uh, I came across a report from a US vet who said that they got loaded with a bunch of tigers being transported. And then Rosie Ryan tells me that a long time ago, they got loaded with a giraffe. So you can, you can be loaded with anything. So they are just cargo. So the management of horses during the transport can contribute to their stress. So the frequency and duration of stops, the feeding and water. So like to um, feed, the hay th feed hay throughout the horse's flight. And they start off with the chest bars up and the hay bales high and tied up reasonably short. And once the, basically the seatbelt light is off, um, then the bars can be dropped to allow the horse to drop its head and eat off the ground. And then water's um, offered at regular intervals, but a lot of horses won't drink until they're about eight hours into the flight. And that's okay, they're, they're doing a bit, as I say, they're moving around a bit and balancing, but they're not going to become dehydrated unless they have an illness in eight hours. So some of the companies will give an electrolyte pace mid-flight, but generally most of them cope fine and start to drink after about eight hours. So the method of horse restraint, as I just alluded to, um, if they're travelling for more than eight hours, or well, six to eight hours, they, they shouldn't really be kept cross-tied. And so um, they did find in studies in the 90s that if you hold a horse's head up um, for, for long-haul transport, so more than 24 hours, they definitely there's a definite correlation between the presence of increased microbes in the lungs and also purulent excretions in the respiratory tract and the failure of those um, secretions to be cleared from the airways. So it's very important in long haul transport that they're able to get their head down. So this is um, one of the horses coming into Hong Kong Paralympics. And uh, you can see um, there are two horses in that stable. Um, the water is all in front. The feed's gone because that's been taken out and got rid of as they're coming into the sort of the quarantine type situation. Um, but there's not a lot of room in front of those. And if you're travelling as a vet, you've, your gear's got to be in front of them. So you try to minimise the amount of stuff that goes with a horse. So you try not to send the equissage machine and the saddle and all that with the horse because all it means is that all that stuff is piled up and you can't get the bar right down to allow the horse to get its head down. So minimal stuff goes with the horse. But, and then the grooms have to have their gear in front of an air stable and the vet has to have their gear in front of the stable. So the vet takes very basic gear, um, basic fluids. You've got to remember too that it's very dark in these air stables in the plane. So, and it's very, very confined. So you can't do a hell of a lot. Um, so just the basic drugs, sedatives, colic, that sort of thing to be able to manage most crises. So this is obviously a standard bread going into a three horse air stable. You can see how limited the room is, that's quite a big horse. So when traveling our um, elite athletes, uh, we do like to have um, two horses per stable, but obviously on this trip, I think the, a friend of mine um, gave me these photos to show you, and uh, a, a, he's done a lot of travel with dual hemisphere stallions, so some of them are worth a lot of money and they're still in three stables, but I do know that Equestrian Australia generally sell, sends two horses per air stable. Um, just to give them a bit more room. And you can see all the air stables in the temperature controlled building, um, locked and loaded, ready to go. So the other factors influencing its transport stress are the individual horse. So their sex, are they a stallion? Are they a mare in season? What's their age? So elite athletes are probably going to be older, more experienced horses, but there are plenty of young horses that are transported. So it's going to be very stressful for a young, inexperienced horse. What's their, so what's their prior exposure to that type of transport? 
how do individual horses respond to surrounding horses? They might be put with a horse they've never met. How are they going to respond to that? How are they going to respond if the horse goes berserk next to them? All those sorts of things contribute to an individual horse's stress. What's their vaccination status? And what prior or subsequent exposure to potential pathogens will they have? So they will, just like us on an aeroplane, they will be exposed to different pathogens on planes. It's unavoidable. Horses, like if they've had strangles or if they've had salmonella in the past, those sort of infections can be subclinical. And um, under conditions of transport stress, they can become a problem again. Things like herpes virus, latent infections can become active again under conditions of stress. So how do we grade travel? So basically, it's the time frame. And you have to remember it's door to door. So it's being transported from pre-export quarantine in the truck to the aeroplane and then at the other end from the aeroplane to wherever they're next going to be housed. So the, this is an American type system. Um, we went this way from uh, Kentucky to Kentucky Horse Park where they back the horses in and um, they're just cross-tied in the trucks like that. So it's door to door time. So less than 12 hours is short haul, 12 to 24 hours medium haul and over 24 hours is long haul. And of course, um, it's uh, over the 12 hours that you start to get problems more likely with transport stress and they, become, they can become ill six to, hours, six to eight hours into the journey. So you want to export your equine athlete. What are your considerations? So you need to ring up your shipping agent. Um, so there's, there's quite a few agents, so IRT, New Zealand Bloodstock, Pedens are some agents. Uh, inform them when the horse is going and when it needs to be competing. You've got to factor in any pre-export quarantine period and that can be up to 30 days. So you have to also decide in your mind um, how long you want to be there. So to get the horse over a simple illness, you probably need eight days. So you probably need to arrive eight days prior to a competition. But then horses travelling internationally, they're changing time zones, everything's different, the atmosphere's different, the feed's different, the water's different. And what they've found um, over the years is that horses do really well in a fairly short time frame. But they don't do so well at about the six week mark. At about the six week mark, the performance levels tend to drop. So they, that's when they're just sort of getting over and adjusting to the new environment. So if you're going to stay longer in a place, you might be better off going for, say, four to six months and then your major competition. So you have to, you have to give a little bit of thought to what you're doing, when you're going to arrive and the time frame. You may have to compromise, though, because if you're an individual as part of a group shipment, then they may not have flights or um, availability for you to go when you want. You might have to work in with a group shipment. So all those are considerations. So the shipping company, they're responsible for organising and overseeing all the health requirements for the destination country. So that includes the vaccinations and blood tests that need to be done prior to actually being exported. So, for instance, for Tokyo Olympics, um, the horses will be required, if they've never had equine influenza vaccinations, they will be required to have two equine influenza vaccinations. Now, we can't get those as vets in Australia since it became... Um, uh, sort of, they got rid of the disease, they're no longer available, so the shipping companies actually send it to the vets to give when that horse, the contract's been done for them to be exported. But you do, we still have to consider that if there is, um, if the horse is unwell when it mounts an immune response to the vaccination, then you need to leave enough time for the horse to be healthy by the time it goes into pre-export quarantine. And you also need to um, be aware of the FEI rule. They have to be vaccinated within that six-month period. So you, they will, you and they have to think about those considerations. They'll also need a blood test for um, EIA, equine infectious anemia. 
and to make sure that the titer levels are negative. So there can be a problem with blood tests sometimes, as I learnt. Um, so there's a disease called equine viral arteritis. It's particularly important in stallions. So um, a stallion was, well, it was a colt when it was imported and it came from Europe and it had a, a negative titer to um, equine viral arteritis. Then 10 or 12 years later, it was taken overseas and again, it had a negative titer to, so antibody level to equine viral arteritis. It did the competition and then the pre-export blood test back to Australia was positive for equine viral arteritis. So what happened, because we could not quite understand how this happened, um, is that the sensitivity of the testing that was done in the third instance was different to the sensitivity of the testing done in the first two instances. And the horse actually had very low positives in both the first instances, but it met the requirements for a negative equine viral arteritis test. But it didn't meet the requirements for the third equine viral arteritis test. So the horse had to stay an extra month in quarantine to prove that it did not have um, equine viral arteritis and it didn't have rising titers of the antibodies. So these little things can be hiccups and that's an extra month of quarantine cost in a foreign country that can happen. <laughs> um, the... Uh, it, Shipping company is also responsible for the road transport from the pre-export quarantine to the aircraft and then the loading of the horses onto the aircraft and the journey. So here they are. Now we have really good sheds. Most countries have really good sheds that, as I said, temperature controlled that they can load in. That's because 20 odd years ago they had at least one incidence of horses getting away on the runway. Not good. So now they can't get away at all. It's temperature controlled and they can load them very safely. That's... So putting the horse on the plane. Air stables, they're very lightweight aluminium box constructions which can travel three horses safely. And actually, I have seen a group of miniatures in one air stable. I had about seven in it. They'd just taken the whole thing out and they're all running around together. <laughs> so uh, whatever works. Um, so they can be modified to carry two, as I said, which is optimum for the larger equine athletes. Uh, once the horses are contained in the air stable, they're then transported and loaded onto the plane like baggage and lifted up into the plane on a hydraulic lift. So this is quite stressful for the horses because it's quite noisy and uh, there's a lot going on. So here they are being transported in the air stables all in a group and ready to get on the plane. They come into the um, low rollers here and the mechanical rollers just zoot them along to there and then they go up on the hydraulic lift and you can see these are covered completely. So if it's a hot day, it does get very hot inside those air stables. Going on to the aircraft, that's the coming in and then it's just, they're basically gutted passenger planes and some of them are actually dual passenger and cargo aeroplanes. So, um, and these rollers are all automatically operated from switches on the walls so they can manoeuvre the air stables wherever they like and then they lock them down. So this is a different system and this domestically happens in the US, uh, may happen in other countries too. But basically, um, the slide I think Anne showed yesterday where there's a, a ramp up into the plane, that's how this is done. And they run the horses up into the plane just uh, in hand and then they build the stables around them. So they just lock them in. And we, we travelled that way from between LA and Kentucky and with the Japanese endurance horses and 30-odd other horses on the plane, our event is one of our dressage horses. So, and um, as you can see, there are no grooms in between there. They're just all in together and they're all, um, on the next photo, they're cross-tied. So, ad lib good quality haze recommended during the journey. Allow their heads down, as I said, to drain the airway secretions. Um, and I, I 
no rugs, but do think carefully about boots too, because you, so I forgot to mention that, when horses have shoes on, it's a, I think if you've got your own farrier, particularly if you're only going for a short period of time, it's probably best not to take the shoes off to travel. So just wrap the shoes in Elastoplast four or five rounds just around the shoe because horses stamp their feet a lot during the travelling process. And so if they stand on their shoe, it is very, very difficult to get in there and fix the problem. Same with boots. If their boots fall down and fall underneath their legs and they start stamping, it becomes becomes a bit of a problem and even a small wiry person it's very contained and it's a little bit dangerous to just get in with a horse in a very kind confined area like that so um, you have to think carefully about what you send the horse in so again you can see the panels on the side that they build it with and then they're just uh, cross-tied there so peering over the cargo that's their view out the top of the air stable and you can see along the sides, there's not very much room to access the air stables. Um, so the grooms and the vet, there are often only four or five chairs on these planes. So not many people go with these horses. So there's a ladder down from where you sit and most companies now recommend that, well, they insist that you sit during land, um, takeoff and landing that you are in your seat with your seatbelt fastened. And I did get to um, go in the cockpit when we landed in LA at night of a 747. I don't need to do it again. But um, you get to do some things that are really incredible. But, um, yeah, you must be seat belted in. So the horses, they're, they're usually pretty quiet during takeoff and landing. But you do, um, on some of the planes, you have to take an oxygen cylinder down each time you access the horses just in case there's um, depressurisation occurs when you're on the plane. So, post-flight... <laughs> Um, body temperature needs to be monitored closely, so take the temperature at least twice a day post-flight for three days. It should be under 38.5 degrees Celsius. There's been a new test, well it's relatively new, maybe it's come to the fore in about the last five years and it's become a stable si stall side test, so, you, so it's just a little machine and it measures a protein called serum amyloid A and this is a blood biomarker that is released um, with tissue inflammation or it can be quite elevated with infection. And it's a little bit more sensitive than normal blood tests that look at white cells and albumin and fibrinogen and things like that. So it helps you to pick up um, problems much quicker than a normal blood test. So um, monitor that for several days, at least once a day. Horses tend to lose body weight during the flight because they're, they're stressed. So 2.5 kilos per hour of long horse haul transport is about the standard for a thoroughbred. They should put this back on at least three to seven days post-travel and they should start eating as soon as the excitement, so the two-hour excitement period is over once they've got to their destination. So... For resuming normal activity, you allow one rest day for under 12 hours transport and it's recommended that you allow three days for over 12 hours transport. So if you want to hack them out, that might be fine after two days, but it, it's very low level. Give the horse time to um, just get over their journey. Uh, there are some um, problems uh, that can occur. So, um, as I mentioned, shipping fever, which is a respiratory disease, we'll talk more about that in a second, um, laminitis and colitis. So, colitis is a bacterial diarrhoea. Um, it can occur under conditions of stress. If you get um, nasty bacteria like salmonella, it can develop during the flight. It is life-threatening. So, um, those things have to be monitored closely. Um, laminitis, um, that can occur if people fatten up their horses so that because they're, they're worried they're going to lose weight. If they're already fat, they're going to tip over the edge and um, with the stress. So it's insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So basically that disease can be very subclinical and um, just with a big long haul transport trip that, that can occur.
So shipping fever, as I said, it's a respiratory infection associated quite often with long-haul transport. Uh, they get an increased respiratory rate, nasal discharge and coughing, and it's an, often a very distinctly soft cough. So the clinical signs are not very much, to be honest. Um, they're just depressed and basically got this soft cough. And a lot of them, um, they start to walk a bit stiff because they, they progress on to pneumonia very quickly, I might add, and pleurisy where they have fluid around their lungs. And it's quite painful and they, they do walk very stiffly because of the pain in their chest. It's um, very, very serious disease. They can have um, post-disease complications like laminitis. It can occur quite quickly um, during after the departure, so you have to be really onto horses that are depressed during or become depressed during the flight. Um, they have to have their chest strain if they get these large um, accumulations of fluid. It's very unlikely they're going to compete if they do develop this in a short time frame. And, um, and they can develop long-term adhesions between the lungs and the body wall. So it's a very serious disease. And definitely the one factor that helps to prevent shipping fever is enabling the horse to drain its airways by getting its head down during the flight. So the summary of recommendations do not put a horse suffering respiratory disease, insulin resistance or any other illness or in any form on long haul transport. The old adage is sick horse on, sicker horse off. And so it's very important you don't get them overweight to travel. They don't, they don't die of losing a bit of weight during, during long haul flights. But if you get them obese or they travel when they're obese and they have subclinical insulin resistance, definitely they can tip over the edge. And that does happen in this country a lot with show hacks that travel certainly from Queensland to Victoria. They do have subclinical insulin resistance because they're so fat and they get to the other end and they've got a major laminitis problem. So it's best in pre-export quarantine, they endeavour to keep the hay, sim to keep the feed simple. The horses are no longer generally in work and um, they need their grain cut. The horses don't get grain on the fr flight because the grain causes gas buildup. And so they're better off just having ad lib hay, keep it simple. So they need, in pre-export quarantine, they need to make the transition from having grain and hard feed plus hay to having just hay only, getting on the plane, having just hay only again. No prophylactic antibiotics, no bute, and no immunostimulants. So why no prof prophylactic antibiotics? Firstly, there is no evidence to suggest that giving antibiotics to a horse before it gets on long haul transport makes any difference whatsoever to them not developing disease. The second thing is that it changes the bacterial flora of their gut. And so um, by giving them prophylactic antibiotics, it, they are um, scientific papers have looked at the incidence of colitis doing that and there's definitely is a risk associated with developing colitis in long haul transport and the giving of antibiotics prior to transport. Certainly if the horse becomes ill during transport then we treat them with aggressive antibiotic therapy. But if they're well, um, don't give prophylactic antibiotics. The reason you don't give phenylbutazone or flunixin or those is because they lower the temperature. And so you want to know if the horse has a spike in its temperature during the travel. And by giving it anti-inflammatories, may, that may delay you actually realising that there's a problem because the temperature won't spike. So it's advised not to give anti-inflammatories. Water's to be offered regularly. Um, it is better if they're relaxed and allowed to urinate and again monitor the temperature twice daily um, for three days after long haul travel of any kind. So we get to the next part of the topic. We've got our horse to the destination or we're at home in Queensland and we're going to talk a bit about um, heat, <laughs> managing horses in hot climates. And, and you need to understand a little bit about how horses control their core body temperature. 
So there is an organ in the base of the brain called the hypothalamus, and this is the controller for the body core temperature. And this um, receives a whole heap of information from uh, receptors in the internal organs and in the skin, and it also, um, it also receives information from the blood in the carotid artery that's bathing the hypothalamus. So it, um, it uh, reacts in response to body temperature. So the, um, the set point um, is a very narrow limit at which the body desires to control its temperature. And it, it, um, the hypothalamus then sets off a chain of reactions um, that trigger behavioural responses like seeking shade or going in the water um, or, and physiological responses, so vasodilation, so opening of the blood vessels or vasoconstriction. You know, we get hot, that's vasodilation, um, and we get cold and you look blue, that's vasoconstriction, and horses, you can't see what colour they are, um, but they do exactly the same thing in hot and cold weather. So... Um, the hypothalamus um, regulates this at narrow limits. It can be changed, so horses can be acclimatised to hot conditions. So I think it's really great we're a hot country and we're going to compete in Tokyo because our horses are acclimatised to hot weather. So um, that set point is going to be a little different to horses from cold climates. So this is my very fat brood mare in summer sweating up a storm. So you need to understand the mechanisms of um, heat transfer in, in horses to understand how to cool your horse. So there are four mechanisms of heat transfer. There's evaporation, and this is, it's a bit of theory, but I think this is quite important. So evaporation occurs when it turns the liquid, which is sweat, into a vapour. So you need a vapour pressure gradient between the sweat and the vapour for that to work. It also occurs through the lungs because you have a very large um, surface area of the alveoli in the lungs or the, the air sacs in the lungs. So that increases your surface area. So panting is the other way that horses can get rid of heat. Radiation is a very fast way for heat transfer, and this is electromagnetic waves. And so this, this is threefold, so it comes from solar radiation, there's reflected solar radiation coming up from the ground, there's ground thermoradiation, and there's also radiation coming off the horse. So this relies on a temperature gradient for this to occur. You then have conduction, which is a transfer of energy and loss of heat by direct contact. So when your saddle cloth is on the horse, your saddle cloth becomes hot because there is a transfer of energy across those two objects. And then you have convection, which is heat transfer within a fluid. So this occurs, um, the muscles are pumping and there's blood flow in the muscles and then it's moving blood all around the body. So there's a loss of heat through the rest of the body from the muscles as well. This is convection. It also occurs if you're throwing water over the horse and it's transferring the heat from the sweat to the water that you're cooling the horse with. And that's a slow um, transfer as well, depends on the density of the fluid. So those are the four ways that horses can lose heat or gain heat. So horses are very inefficient. Um, they produce uh, massive, they have massive metabolic muscular production. So the Muscles produce a lot of energy and 20% goes into work and 80% goes into heat production. So sweating is the major form of heat release and there's only a small surface area from which sweating can occur. But sweat losses can be as high as 10 litres per hour and they can, be account, they can account for about 75% of the heat loss. The remainder of the heat is stored or it's got to be lost by other means. So when conditions are high humidity and the ambient temperature is high, ev evaporation will be limited because the, the vapour pressure between the sweating and the air is small because it's very humid. 
Dehydration can also reduce the conductance of heat from the core to the periphery, and we'll talk a bit about that later, just because blood flow is reduced. So there are sweat glands in haired and relatively hairless skin. Um, sweating produces both ions, although not like in humans. In humans, we lose a lot of ions in sweating, but horses lose fewer, but, but particularly sodium chloride and potassium. They produce a lot of fluid and they produce a surfactant called latherin, which is responsible for helping um, dissipation of the sweat. Adrenaline is a chemical responsible, so the hypothalamus stimulates um, physiological systems using adrenaline um, to cause sweating. And that's why in cases of horses that can't sweat, anhydrosis, we use um, very tiny concentrations of adrenaline to try and test how much they're actually able to sweat. So this is the fight or flight, the energetic um, hormone. Um, but the sensitivity of sweat glands to adrenaline does differ between breeds. So Arabians are definitely the masters of um, being able to man, um, keep heat control. So factors influencing sweating rate, uh, exercise intensity, environmental conditions, the hydration status, the effects of exercise um, exercise training and heat acclimatisation. And there are a few little equine-related characteristics. And then there are regional and individual variations in sweat gland activity. So, the exercise intensity. The higher the muscle activity occurs, the higher the body temperature becomes because the heat's being stored and there's not enough sweating occurring. So the, and that's um, negative feedback system to the hypothalamus, which is producing more adrenaline, which in turn produces more sweating. That occurs to a point where it just, um, there's a gradual increase and then it plateaus. So that needs to be remembered. The environmental conditions, and for us cooling horses, I think this is the most important one. So the thermal load imposed on the horse is dependent on the duration and intensity of work and the external heat load on the horse. So under hot conditions, as I explained, the radiative heat losses, so the electromagnetic uh, wave heat loss is minimal because the temperature gradient between the horse and the atmosphere is minimal. So they don't lose heat that way. But in just hot, dry conditions, they can lose it through evaporation. So you can throw the cold water on, scrape it off, and gradually lower the temperature that way with a fan. The problem comes in humid conditions, as I explained, where you have high water vapour pressure in the air. And so the mechanism of sweating evaporation, it, it doesn't work. So you have to lose the heat by convection. So that means throwing loads of iced water or cold water onto the horse. And that, the heat is transferred very quickly to the water layer on the horse. So you have to keep, and the endurance riders are experts at this, you have to keep putting the cold water on the horse to allow the energy to be transferred. And that way the horse can dissipate, dissipate the heat um, that's associated with the work intensity after it's finished. So, um, I mean, if it's milder conditions, then you may not need ice. But in um, very humid conditions and when they're very high intensity exercise, you need heaps and heaps of ice to make the um, temperature gradient between the fluids um, great. So, um, someone asked yesterday about the temperature of competitions. And so, in more recent times, there's the measurement of wet bulb globe temperature. So, the definition of this from Wikipedia is the type of apparent temperature um, that was measured for humans that took into account the humidity, the ambient temperature, the wind chill factor, and uh, the radiation, the infrared radiation um, on humans. 
This has now been um, tr sort of put across to horse sports and they're now certainly at the Tokyo test event. They, they talked a lot about the wet bulb globe temperature and this is the sort of machine that measures it on the right. And I looked up the hot weather policies and um, the EA has a hot weather policy as do the FEI. And it becomes very important when, certainly in Queensland, it actually really made me think about it because, so you can see a wet bulb globe temperature, and these are very basic recommendations. There's a whole table in the recommendations, and on one axis is the um, ambient temperature, on the other axis is the humidity. But 30 degrees Celsius and 45% humidity, there doesn't need to be changes to the normal competitional format. But over 33, which is 32 degrees and 60% humidity, which does occur on a reasonably regular basis in Queensland, the organisers, the, certainly the FEI, have put out that the, unless you have cooling conditions adequate, as the FEI does, like things like air conditioned stables, um, lots and lots of water, which has become a problem in Australia because some of these competitions don't have a lot of water available, um, ice available and loads of ice available. Um, there's got to be enough watering points that all the horses, if they're under minute intervals in eventing, they've got to be able to access the water. So unless you can provide that, then you've got to think about stopping the competition because these horses might not be able to get rid of their heat load. Now, it does depend on what work intensity these horses are at, but I think if Australia is to become hotter and drier, um, we do have to start thinking about this um, with relation to our competitions. Now, we, we might make twilight competitions when it's cooler. Certainly at six o'clock in the morning in Queensland, it is really hot and really humid. So early morning might not be the answer. It might have to be in the evenings. Um, jumping efforts, uh, they decrease um, in the competition. They might be decreased the day of competition, depending on the wet bulb globe temperature. So I think that has to be thought of. So the hydration status of the horse um, is important. It's not so important in a dressage horse because it's not the activity is not as prolonged as, say, an endurance horse or a cross-country athlete. So in humans, iron concentrations are lost that are very high in sweat loss. So they become dehydrated reasonably quickly. In horses, um, the irons that are lost in the sweat are not as many as in humans, so they don't become dehydrated at quick, as quickly. But you do start to get dehydration problems after they've been um, exercising for one and a half hours at 32 to 34 degrees Celsius. So that's why intravenous fluids are used quite a lot in eventing and endurance sports when they're starting to become depleted with their irons. So that dehydration, because you've got less blood flow from your muscles around the body, you've got less blood flow to the skin, that's decreasing the amount of sweating that can occur. So exercise training and acclimatisation, um, training promotes sweating economy, um, you don't get a change in the sweat gland but the set point can be altered um, to, to allow the core temperature to be a little higher than for a lot of other horses, uh, you get a more effective distribution of blood volume to the skin. Um, but it does take at least two months um, of training in that sort of weather for the horse to become acclimatised. And the economy is not so, the sweating economy is not so apparent at lower temperatures, but around 32 to 34 degrees Celsius, it becomes more apparent. So, um, funny thing about horses, uh, they not dressage horses, they don't do it for long enough, but endurance horses, um, sweat ducts in, in, well, in all horses are keratinised. So just like if you leave your hand in water for an extended period of time and it becomes soggy, um, when they sweat for a prolonged period of time, so hours, then the sweat glands, the, ker the keratinised cells become um, swollen and that partially blocks the sweat ducts. So they, they tend to sweat a bit less. So then um, your cooling systems become more important.
Um, so the reason why horses start sweating on the side of their necks and their chest and the, and the um, inside the hind legs first is just because of the um, sweat gland density in those areas and then eventually they start sweating on their faces and their hind quarters. Um, and there are definitely individual variations between breeds in ability to sweat or not sweat. So um, I had to do a bit of research on this because I'm not familiar with cold climates at all and not seriously cold climates. So um, very briefly, <laughs> it, it is the same principle. So the hypothalamus recognises um, that the, it wants to keep the core temperature at a certain temperature and if it's colder than what it wants to be, then it, it um, causes mechanisms to occur that keep that core temperature fairly stable. So it will cause vasoconstriction. So, um, in, and horses do get climatised to a cold weather. So in acclimatised horses, they can quite comfortably have their skin temperature as low as five degrees when they've measured it with um, little thermometers. So um, they're very, very tolerant to um, cold weather. But it's also the same principle in that once the muscles, if you're exercising them, once the muscles start to work, they start producing the heat. As the work intensity increases, then the heat dissipation mechanisms cut in. So, and this occurs even in um, clipped horses at below zero. So um, it's all the same principles of heat, of hot climates. So there was one experiment that Swedish did, the Swedish group did at minus two to minus eight degrees Celsius. And um, the take home was that um, if you're low intensity exercising, so say trail riding through the snow, then even haired animals should wear a blanket so that um, the cold defence mechanisms are, aren't brought into play so much. But as the exercise intensity increases, the blanket can be removed, um, and then further increase in exercise intensity, um, they need to be able to dissipate the heat. So hairy animals don't dissipate the heat as well, so the, the heart rates and the respiratory rates didn't recover as quickly as they should have in animals that weren't clipped. So the take home from the experiment was that at high intensity of exercise, um, so horses in high training, they should still be clipped to allow the sweating to get away and evaporate. But when you've got a layer of fur on the horse, that, that is um, limited. So just as a sum up for cold temperature, you do need to warm your horses up a little longer in cold, um, cold weather so that the muscles get a chance, the blood flow gets moving through the muscles and they get more of a chance um, to get, get going. Um, and similarly, with the warm down needs to be a bit um, longer. In hot temperatures, uh, offer, the horse needs to be offered water at regular intervals. You need to think about the type of weather that you're riding in and adjust your cool down accordingly. Um, they should be at almost 40 beats per minute, their heart rate by half an hour after exercise at rest. Um, you need to keep cooling them until they do. Um, you need to cool them until they're at least a temperature of 38.5 and then if it's hot, don't let them stand around because it can go right back up again. So you need to keep either walking them or cooling them or you need to give it some thought when, you, when you're competing with high intensity exercise. And I think that sums it up. Thank you very much.